Hello friends, this is Savius, and welcome to Stellar Journeys Episode 2, the series where you get to come with me from the 1950s all the way to the far future. Picking up where we left off, October 12th, 1952. Aristotle 1 takes off on an Aero 2 launch vehicle bound for low carbon orbit. By now, the scientists at KSO, a carbon space organization, have mastered the art of rocketry, if you will, and are quite confident in their launching capabilities, and have advertised so to multiple clients. The Aristotle 1, in all intents and purposes, is a rudimentary weather satellite, only carrying one Geiger counter and one thermometer. Aristotle 1's goal is to measure ambient radiation and detect on whether or not space actually does carry temperature. Once the sustainer engine cuts off, the probe is spin stabilized until it drifts into apparatus. Once there, the engine ignites once more using vernier thrust. Like all probes of its era, Aristotle 1 is separated from the sustainer stage from a kick motor. Several weeks later, radiation readings show promising results, and no, there is no temperature in space. Aristotle 1 will remain in orbit for several months, continuing to read varying radiation waves. In March of 1953, an Aero 2 was launched with an enlarged fairing. The payload of this rocket, interestingly enough, remained classified well into the 1960s. But I'm here to let you in on a little bit of a secret. You see, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, the Carbon Space Exploration Bureau was hard at work sending many probes to the moon. However, the probes were not very significant due to lack of funding. Two communication satellites would be deployed. One would be in low carbon orbit, and the other in high lunar orbit. In order to conserve space inside the fairing, the probes were launched in tandem on top of each other. Once the first probe was launched, the transfer stage would ignite its engines again for transmitter injection. The journey usually takes about one and a half days. Once there, the probe is released, and it immediately starts transmitting data from the month. A significant milestone, and a job well done for sending a first probe with stable orbit to another celestial body. December of 1953. The Kerbin Science Organization accepts contracts from the Eastern Kerbin Military Organizations. With the promise of additional funds and freedom to research as they wish, as long as they accept contracts from the military, it was an offer too hard to refuse. The payload, to this day, is still classified as a weather satellite, although many do believe that it was to be different. Too many things lined up, too many coincidences, and it was just plain suspicious. With new funding comes new innovation. This next satellite is launched on a new variant of the Aero 2 launcher, with more fuel and another stage to carry it further into orbit. In my opinion, it's just another missile they're willing to play with. To the military, the Aero 2B was an excellent payload delivery system for either satellites or for nuclear warheads. The specifications of this payload was that it had to be solar powered, collect UV and photopolymetric data, as well as be able to return images from space. The parts of the classified report that I'm allowed to read to you today says the probe went high above the Van Karman line and then went back down into low carbon orbit. Of course, that is just a theory. It could have just blown up in orbit. Here's what we do know. The probe was outfitted with a return capsule, and we do know that return capsule returned to Earth, because our recovery teams were the ones that collected it. We weren't allowed to look inside, but we do know that it spent several months in space, with imagery data. It's just a theory.
on September 16, 1968, after various contracts concerning the survivability of biologicals in space, the Kerbin Science Committee is contracted to send the first Kerbal to orbit. The launch goes off without a hitch. The engine ignites normally, and all avionics were go. According to Tolan Ben Kerman, who was the fated Kerbal fortunate enough to take such a wondrous flight, the ride quality aboard a retrofitted ICBM was rather enjoyable. Strapped in with nothing but a pressure suit, some avionics panels, and some state-of-the-art scientific equipment, there was hardly enough room to be comfortable aboard this flight. Engineers say that the maximum flight time would be around four days. Thankfully, Tolanbin would not spend that long in space. The Columbus 1 capsule was not outfitted with much radiation shielding due to weight constraints aboard the ICBM, I mean, rocket. Much to the woes of the engineers involved, the capsule had one window, and it was rather small. The engine on the service module was a brand new design featuring ceramic on the engine bell instead of the previously used aluminum alloys. In theory, the ceramic composites allowed for longer burn times and more emissions. However, the engine was prone to more chipping along the bell nozzle. Once at the height of its orbit, the service bay opens. Interestingly enough, this all occurred during an eclipse, almost as if it were a sign. After about a day cooped up in the tiny little Columbus 1 capsule, Tolumbin goes out on EVA to do material studies. Studies show that the mystery goo does indeed feel right at home at low carbon orbit. Once Tolumbin had stared long enough at the goo and contemplated life's petty little troubles, he finally decided to climb back inside the capsule and return back to carbon. Thankfully. As we watched the mildly irradiated capsule of Columbus 1 return back to Kerbin, I would like to mention that yes, this video was indeed published rather close to the previous video. Uh, that may or may not be consistent, uh, just simply because I haven't had a set upload schedule yet. But regardless, this will be a continual series. Back to the action, and here we see the parachutes safely deploy on Columbus 1, and the capsule gently places itself into the ocean. That concludes today's episode of Stellar Journeys. Thank you all very much for watching. Please subscribe and like, and let me know your comments down below. I'd love to hear your feedback. This has been Savius, signing off.